and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and developments in modern Chinese culture, politics, economics, and social issues. My name is Madeline Federley, and I will be your moderator for our program today. Today on China Forum, we will be discussing Chinese corruption and President Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaigns. We are happy to welcome today's expert, Dr. Cheng Li. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Dr. Cheng Li is the Director of Research and a Senior Fellow at the John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution. He is also the Principal Editor at the Thornton Center Chinese Thinker Series. Dr. Li has published extensively on China's political leaders and trends, including the books China's Emerging Middle Class, Beyond Economic Transformation, China's Changing Political Landscape, Prospects for Democracy, China's Leaders, the New Generation, and Rediscovering China, Dynamics and Dilemmas of Reform. Dr. Li has been featured in numerous publications, including The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Time, and The Economist. Dr. Li, thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Since the beginning of his term as General Secretary of China's Communist Party, Xi Jinping has publicly stated that the rampancy of official corruption was ruining the party and the country. Since this statement, President Xi Jinping has conducted an aggressive anti-corruption campaign, promising to go after official corruption involving both low-level flies and high-level tigers. Why do you think Xi Jinping has taken corruption so seriously? And what are the factors that have led to Xi's declaring a war on corruption? Well, I think that um, uh, your question and your introduction actually already answer that question. Because as he said, that the, the corruption is ruining the party and also the country. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of life and death. It's uh, for, from his perspective or from the perspective of the Chinese Communist Party, is a matter of a survival. So they need to do something before too late. So uh, he launched a very, very uh, powerful or strong campaign I mean, to different levels, flyers, low-level <laughs> officials, and tigers. And uh, this, uh, this is already happening. And um, uh, uh, just to give you an example, that uh, uh, 19 vice ministers and uh, vice governors or above including four members of the Central Committee and the uh, other mm -hmm. members, or four members, you know, who are just uh, uh, appointed a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. now arrested. And uh, uh, certainly the cases, uh, investigation official corruption, the number is also unprecedentedly high. So this is uh, what he promised. Now the reason, the factors are multiple, but the two most important ones, the first, is related with legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. And also among that, his own popularity and uh, mm -hmm. as an effective leader. Secondly, uh, China's corruption is really unprecedentedly high at the moment. Mm -hmm. People, you know, officials are storing money from the state, not a matter of the thousand dollars or, or, or you know, even a couple of million dollars, but we talk about almost a, a couple of billion in mm -hmm. some of the cases. So this is, is astonishing. Certainly it hurts the economy with this kind of uh, corruption that the whole country, the whole economy uh, is in jeopardy. You cannot make money because all the money goes to the corrupt officials. Particularly the time you want to change from uh, export-led, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of labor-intensive economy to innovation-driven economy. With corruption, you have a state monopoly. They reinforce each other. So that should be stopped and b before that uh, the whole economy collapsed. So political reason and economic reason, these are the two major factors driving this very, very impressive campaign. Mm. So when you say that it's vital for the survival, do you mean for the survival of the Communist Party or the survival of China as a whole? Well, I think that uh, from Xi Jinping's perspective, he talked about two, but I think more importantly is the uh, a Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. There was a saying before said that if we really take anti-corruption seriously, the party will be gone. If we do not <laughs> take anti-corruption seriously, the country will be gone. <laughs> you know, of course, that's a that's kind of a play around the words, but that reflects the the really serious concern 
for the nation. And but I, in my view, it's more to do with the party, with the leadership. They wanted to change、uh, this kind of poor image. They wanted to regain, you know, from their perspective, legitimacy. And otherwise, that、uh, they are really in big trouble. Right. So I know many critics claim that past anti-corruption campaigns have been characterized by a lot of, you know, big actions. I'm sorry, big words, few actions, or big thunder and small rain. Do you think Xi's new efforts are different from past campaigns, and why are they different? Well, the differences are two. One is the early on said that、uh, you look at the past year or so, 19 senior officials、mm-hmm. are arrested. That includes the person in charge of. Uh, state-owned enterprises, the minister of the、uh, SASEC, they call the state-owned assets uh, uh, kind of uh, commission, and、um, uh, uh, he also was a tycoon in the oil industry, and also included the, the you know、uh, the vice minister of the public security, a、uh, very powerful figure. But now you are also dealing with some even bigger tigers, and there's still some of the investigation going on, and、uh, so that's about very much a real. And when you deal with,、uh, you know, these concentric committee members, alternate or even higher leaders, that certainly show、uh, you are quite serious. But at the same time, that also changed the behavior of leaders. And、uh, because Xi Jinping, particularly in the areas of anti-flies, talk about you should、uh, you should not do certain things. Not you should not use state assets for banquet. You、mm. cannot use state money for luxury uh, uh, products, including Mao Tai. Including cigarettes, expensive cigarettes.、Mm-hmm. So the multi-sales rate drop significantly. The Rolex market in Hong Kong、mm-hmm. and in China also dropped significantly.、Right. So in a way, you change the behaviors of leaders. You go to VIP room in Macau, a gambling place. You will see that the you know the changes because the、mm-hmm. previously the the clients, the customer usually. You know, officials, all rank of officials, but now that kind of people that do not dare to go to Macau for gambling, you know, so that tells you、mm. the behavior change. Now there's a concern that because of this lack of spending, you know, in terms of、uh, uh, luxury,、uh, you know, kind of restaurants and the products, so there's a concern about how that will hurt the economy. So that tells you behavior change of the Chinese、mm. leaders. So I think it's、uh, getting real. So it's very very important. I'm not saying this is a fundamental change yet, and、uh, you critics could criticize this campaign method is still largely old-fashioned way. It's not too much depend on the legal, you know, process. But let's face it, that、uh, it's very very difficult for a country establish legal system overnight or within few years. Look at the UK. Look at the United States. We are still fighting, you know, to try to consolidate the legal system.、Mm-hmm. And uh, for uh, for uh, uh, United Kingdom, it took several centuries, you know, to really uh, 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 make the rule of law become real, the constitution、uh, respected. For China, you may not need centuries, but still you need some time, right? So. Uh, it's Wang Qishan, one of the anti-corruption,、uh, really the anti-corruption czar,、uh, Power Bureau Standing Committee member. He said very clearly, "Yes, we are dealing with symptoms. We are not dealing with a root cause. But this gave us time, allow us to buy time before too late. So when you first deal with you know symptom, when you buy time, then you can establish a legal system eventually to uh, 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 deal with the root cause.、Mm-hmm. Now." I actually think his views are sincere, because that's the the best strategy, and otherwise you means revolution, and no one's interest have such kind of revolution、mm-hmm. in drastic change. But you may not also resolve the problem of corruption. So this kind of、uh, combination emphasizes the rule of law, make a solid progress towards that direction, but at the same time use the party's own mechanism to or the maybe even old style uh, uh, method to deal with. Uh, this campaign,、mm-hmm. it's not the、uh, the perfect system. It has some flaws, but uh, it uh, it seems to me that they already uplift the confidence, public confidence,、mm. about the new leadership. So I guess going off of that, I know that by initiating these anti-corruption campaigns, Xi Jinping、um, runs the risk of alienating, you know, 
the very power base on which the party stands. So are you of the opinion that perhaps, you know, reforming the legal system or abiding by, you know, strengthening China rule of law is perhaps a way to both go after corruption that is pleasing for the elites and for the general public? Well, yes, this is only for a long run. Again, it's a, it's a impossible you establish mm -hmm. a legal system overnight. Right. And, uh, but uh, you do need to avoid that your anti-corruption campaign only used for political purpose, target your political rivals or enemies. Certainly, Xi Jinping does not have that kind of reputation because mm -hmm. some of the corrupt officials are princelings, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the leaders come from prominent family like himself. So he joined a very clear line that whoever, you know, uh, are notorious uh, corrupted leaders, they should uh, subject to investigation. Mm -hmm. So that's a good statement. So he joined a line that uh, this is not purely driven by power struggle. You can also argue that uh, eventually it's related, if we give him more power, and uh, more popularity, he may use that political capital to appoint his own people. So indirectly, it may relate it with mm -hmm. the, the, the Chinese uh, elite politics. But uh, at least the moment that uh, some of the people arrested could belong to the same coalition, not necessarily political uh, 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 rival. So that's the things he also made him more popular uh, 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 among the public. Now, but uh, your early part of question about uh, this is a danger, there's a danger. Mm -hmm. because corruption is widely spread. When you launch this kind of large-scale anti-corruption campaign, particularly with the flies, you may alienate the very power base you want to rely on. That's a very tricky balance. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you need to uplift public confidence, but at the same time, you should not lose the political support from the political establishment. Mm -hmm. Now, so it is still in the early stage of his tenure, as a top leader. And so far, he has been handled uh, in a very, you know, on the one hand, very impressive for the public, at the same time, not to go too far or too excessive. So let's see whether that balance could maintain. But uh, yes, there's a concern. Some leaders are very nervous mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes maybe even critical about Xi Jinping's leadership. But uh, the general public, the middle class support Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very important power base in itself. Yes. Do you think this perceived, or the real danger of alienating the elite power base is one of the reasons why Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, previous presidents of China, have not taken an anti-corruption campaign as seriously? Well, uh, you can say that. This is a good point. But uh, you can also you can say, that uh, Xi Jinping sense that uh, he needs to do something big, you know, uh, uh, broad and bold. So in addition to economic reform mm -hmm. that uh, he you know, outlined at the third platinum completed you know, a few months ago, mm -hmm. he think anti-corruption is the most important concern because there are so many surveys conducted in China reveal the number one issue for public is corruption. Mm -hmm. Then also environment, economic disparity, mm -hmm. food safety, social justice, name it. But uh, corruption, it's very, very serious, particularly in the wake of like a Bo Xilai scandal, mm -hmm. like a minister of the railroad, like an oil uh, industry, telecommunication industry, you know, uh, etc. So he certainly made a good judgment. He also appointed the, the, the very a uh, 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 powerful leader, Wang Jisan, very, very capable leader, to be in charge of anti-corruption campaign, serving as the secretary of the you know, Central uh, 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 Disciplinary Commission uh, you know, uh, director or secretary. So that, that man, it's, uh, you know, he is a no-nonsense person, mm -hmm. and uh, he is willing to take some risk. So, so far, has been quite successful. So it's, I would say, more to do with new leaders, uh, a sense of urgency, and the, sh the want to take, you know, right to the occasion to deal with this most important challenge the party, the country faces. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably tell us some difference uh, between Xi Jinping on the one hand right. and his predecessors on the other hand. Do you think the corruption, official corruption, is worse now than it was 
20 years ago with Jiang Zemin? Well, I, I, <laughs> well, it's uh, difficult to make uh, that kind of assessment, <laughs> but in terms of amount of money, I mean, certainly it's, uh, it's astonishing, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, the Minister of Railroad, uh, uh, the guy had the nickname called Mr. 4%. In <laughs> any railroad deal, he got 4%. And, uh, but the railroad is a very lucrative business. Right. And um, also that the, the verdict or prosecutors really uh, 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 according to the prosecution, that uh, that uh, minister railroad, he owned 374 housing units, luxury housing units. Each of them could be multi-million. Right. Yeah. So why wow. he want to have so many houses? Because right. he gave you know one to one of the women he slept with. Mm -hmm. You know he is well prepared with 374. <laughs> it's really notorious uh, uh, in China. Mm -hmm. So. That's you cannot compare with you know right. before when I left China in the middle nineteen eighties when we talk of corruption, just uh, you know, you know a couple of hundred dollars, some mm -hmm. boxes of you know cigarettes. That's it. But now you talk about uh, this kind <laughs> of corruption. Okay, so in terms of wealth, perhaps more than before. Well, and also because of China's economic success, right. become you know. And that's uh, a good uh, point. Uh, 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 you know, because it's uh, all of a sudden become the, the second largest right. economy. Right, it's true. So recently, President Xi has crushed a grassroots movement called the New Citizens Movement that calls for government officials to publicly disclose of their assets. Now, Chinese citizens aren't, requ aren't required by law to publicly disclose their assets, and so therefore, many Chinese citizens have been left largely in the dark about the wealth of their leaders. Um, do you think that the public disclosure of officials' personal assets is crucial for Xi's fight against corruption? And can Xi really fight corruption if he doesn't even dare to disclose his own personal assets? Well, there's, here's there's two different questions. One is the objective of this new movement, citizen movement, uh, is very broad mm. for civil rights, for judicial independence, yes, for anti-corruption. and. Uh, uh, the, the demand for you know, disclosure from for officials is one of them. It's not necessarily the most important one. This is one thing I want to clarify. Okay. Secondly, Chinese leadership is, at least uh, you look at the document of Third Platinum and uh, some of the meetings and discussion you know, after that from the top leadership, they actually are willing to do that. They wanted to uh, establish, establish this kind of accountability system, including disclosure of their assets. Now, it's not implemented yet, but it's very much on their agenda. So to a certain extent, it's already effective if we, they want to promote the new leaders mm -hmm. you know, in, at the various levels. Now, let's wait to see. We give them benefit of doubt, because Third Platinum was just completed a few months ago. And uh, it is uh, difficult to establish such kind of system in a short period of time. But at least from the document, they said they are going moving. They are going to move that direction to establish a disclosure system. And there's also some other policies in terms of housing, in terms of the the all kind of benefits. And uh, this is not only just anti-corruption, but also deal with the privileges the senior leaders have, mm -hmm. right? So I think the good things is this is really all around of the the plan to deal with corruption. And uh, actually, the income, the asset disclosure is one of them, I would say. But uh, people could be cynical because it's not fully implemented at the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's see, in the next few years, will give us a better answer whether they also can make a significant progress in this very crucial area, or this is only lip service. Mm. Do you think she's, if he did in his several years disclose his public assets with that really boost his popularity? I think so. I think so. But uh, it's uh, not only just uh, himself, but also that uh, really, in a way, to not only even change the behavior of officials, mm. but ultimately, it's a sense of confidence that the turning point, the peak already gone, the corruption. Now things are getting better. Now, whether he can achieve that in his tenure, you know, he has eight or nine years mm -hmm. left. That's a test, testing point, right? 
But so far, in the first couple of years, he really impressed many mm -hmm. of people, including some of his uh, strong critics. You know, he is a do-something leader, mm -hmm. and uh, anti-corruption is the things he did. He gained a lot of points mm -hmm. along with Wang Qishan. So that's actually, I, I think, quite impressive. Now, in terms of really make this kind of sustainable, not just the one-time campaign, that requires some time to see the ultimate result. Now, again, I'm actually encouraged by you know, the, the, the argument and the, by some of the detailed plan to improve the judicial system, like the vertical leadership, mm -hmm. the local courts no longer report to the local government. That was the cause of the power abuse and the corruption in Chongqing. Mm -hmm. Then Bo Xilai, the party boss of Chongqing, right. control the local court, you know, his, he can order what they should do. So now the, the, uh, the local court should report to the superior court, eventually the, the, the superior court. So that reduced local level corruption. Mm -hmm. So that's an important development. But there's also many other regulations in terms of the court and the composition of judges and the lawyers and etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, you already see the Bo Xilai trial, there's some real procedure things, I think that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. These, these unsanctioned public efforts by the New Citizens Movement have been characterized by the party as, you know, inciting subversion of state power and disturbing social order. So if both of these grassroots movements and she are both fighting corruption, why is, you know, she cracking down on these anti-corruption movements? Is it because he feels like they have the potential to be an even more unstabilizing force? Or is it more like you said just a second ago that while the New Citizens Movement does have an element of an anti-corruption campaign, it's not, you know, its platform is not solely anti-corruption? I think that's an excellent question. I think it's still unclear whether uh, President Xi Jinping himself uh, uh, strongly for crackdown of that movement or some of his uh, colleagues are uh, more, you know, kind of uh, 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 conservative. It's uh, still not entirely clear. But uh, you can imagine in a country in a drastic, uh, you know, change with a strong uh, 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 program for economic reform for the next stage of reform, when the leadership, the Communist Party, faces some legitimacy, legitimacy crisis, mm -hmm. when social media becomes so powerful, right. some leaders are nervous. That is understandable. I'm not saying they are right, because eventually, that uh, uh, these kind of social or new citizen movement, they themselves are stabilizing force, not destabilizing force. Mm. If you really open the system in a in a, a fundamental way, and also when you talk about judicial independence, you talk about the rule of reform, rule of law. Now this is real. Let's be real. So that's a challenge they face. Right. So do you think we might see the day where these kinds of movements are welcome? I hope. I'm more <laughs> optimistic than most other people. I think uh, you do see some uh, drastic change over the years. I think it uh, takes time. There will be not a lenient process. And um, <coughs> excuse me, 20 some years ago, and um, the legal professions are quite weak. Mm and the civil society did not exist at all. But now with social media, with commercialized media, with the rise of legal professions, with the rise of human rights lawyers, mm. and, uh, and uh, so many intellectuals uh, you know, really become quite outspoken, very critical. Right? Now, I think this is uh, uh, encouraging. And, uh, but at the same time, certainly, that uh, Xu Ziyong, his arrest and four-year sentence received a lot of criticism mm -hmm. in China. I personally think that uh, really it's unfortunate. I mm -hmm. think that uh, Xu Ziyong should, uh, 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 is a very popular figure mm -hmm. and a low profile based on my, uh, uh, not a revolutionary leader. Right. right? And uh, I think that uh, that case will be a real test along with some other te tests. And, uh, uh, but uh, I do not know this specific, specific case, but I do s agree with you. There's some crackdown going on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, but my point is that a country's political 
reform or fundamental you know change for you know democracy it will be painful journey <laughs> it will not be so yes. smooth right and um, it requires education like Xu Zhong mm -hmm. himself really did it very well because that movement is very powerful on the one hand mm -hmm. he is a intellectual a PhD in law school but at the same time he spoke on behalf of migrant workers mm -hmm. those less privileged people so there's a linkage between intellectual mm -hmm. movement the constitutional movement with grassroots movement mm -hmm. so it could be very very powerful so I think that the one thing the Chinese leadership should learn again these kind of uh, movement eventually should be seen as a positive force even now they mm -hmm. could be a, a positive force for stabilizing change for gradual change not necessarily as someone said they just want to you know revolution pursue revolution and etc but that requires some conceptual change that also require the social uh, the societal uh, forces become more mature and this also should be uh, a sense of the uh, a kind of civic discourse, avoid some sensational, you know, kind of uh, 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 rumors, and also from a citizen's perspective, also should have a more rational approach for real change. Now, this require this is a complicated process, mm -hmm. and we are only in uh, uh, looking at the first year or year and a half of Xi Jinping's tenure. Yes, there's some progress, there's some positive signs. Yes, there's some concern. There's always been a case. For him, he need to balance. He need to show that uh, he uh, will not take some kind of a drastic move without consulting his own power. So I think that's a little bit too early to jump mm -hmm. to the conclusion. So really, it sounds like for Xi Jinping, it really is a huge balancing act. On the one hand, he has gained a lot of popularity with his anti-corruption movements, and then on the other hand, with like the arrest of Xu yeah. Zhirong, yeah. you know, the public might be upset about that, yes. and so he loses a little bit of popularity and legitimacy. Yeah. Um, in that in that way. Yeah, absolutely. But the important thing is that the, the uh, great change is that the leaders sometimes also will react to public opinion. Mm -hmm how international community, how domestic uh, mainstream thinking or opinion leaders, you know, think about the whole thing. So that self is also a progress, mm -hmm. not like, a, you know, Mao era or even, you know, early, early years or even decade of reform period that uh, the societal force is so weak, but now getting some momentum. Mm -hmm. Well, we have time for one more question. Um, so to conclude, is Xi's fight against corruption essential to the realization of his Chinese dream? Well, Chinese dream includes some other things. I think it's essential for the reason I just mentioned early on. Because the past 10 years or longer, there's a state monopoly. And the state monopoly, so they make middle class shrinking. And the middle class basically did not have any investment opportunity except to put all the money to the real estate. Then you cause some other problem, like a, real, a property bubble, that the shadow banking, local debts, and overcapacity. Mm -hmm. All of them are very, very dangerous. So now if you open the China's market to crack down the state monopoly and the corruption, which linked together, then you give the private sector, particularly middle class, opportunity. So let the poor people to have the opportunity to become middle class. So this is what the Chinese dream is all about. I think yes, the answer is yes, it's hopeful. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time today, but I just wanted to thank Dr. Lee again for joining us today and helping us work through some of these issues. And thank you to all of you who are joining us from home. We will see you next week on China Forum. Mm -hmm.